Justice and righteousness is in the play today as Job begins to really contemplate why he's being punished, so he thinks. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. Job is a book in the Bible that we're studying, the Bible, the 66 books. It's excellent. This is a program helping you do that. Corey also is somebody who helps us do that. Corey, what's up? I'm going to be taking a look at a very important city in ancient Israel. All right, very good. Look forward to that. And you're doing what? We are going to take a look, get your Bible guide, open it up to page eight of the May Guide. We're going to be talking about the concluding statement on the weekly Bible study there. All right, very good. Look forward to that. And also, Ryan is here, right? Well, today I'm beginning another area of study as I explore the life of Job. All right, that is interesting. We're going to look at Job's response to his companions. It was simple. His com he said to his companions, I did nothing wrong but he is suffering. We'll talk about that and more. Although on the program today, we are continuing to read and study through the Old Testament book of Job, you and I are going to be taking a little bit of a break from Job and jumping right back into biblical history. We're going to be focusing in on the city of Shechem. Now, it was a very important city during the time period of the conquest, Joshua and the judges, but it has quite a diverse biblical history as well. Let's take a look at that. With 60 mentions from the pages of the Old Testament of the Bible, the city of Shechem ranks among the most important cities of the historic land of Israel. Located in Israel's central hill country and at the division of a major road, Shechem was flanked by the two tallest mountains in the area, Mount Abal to the north and Mount Gerizim to the south. Its arrangement in this narrow valley pass likely accounts for its name, which in Hebrew means back or shoulder. Today, Shechem has been identified as Tel Balada in the modern city of Nablus and has been the focus of much archaeological survey and excavation. Shechem's first mention in the Bible comes from Genesis 12 as the place where Abram received a promise from God that the land of Canaan would one day belong to his descendants. Abram then built an altar at Shechem. Noticeably absent in this report is a fortified city further explained by archaeological work which tells us that Shechem wasn't fortified until just before Abram's grandson Jacob visited. Jacob's visit saw him camping in front of the fortified city, purchasing a plot of land, and building another altar to God. Later in biblical history, at the command of Moses, Joshua read the book of the law to the Israelites at Shechem, standing on Mount Ebal, which even today acts as a natural amphitheater. Shechem was then made a Levitical city of refuge, and after another covenant renewal ceremony, the bones of Joseph brought out of Egypt were laid to rest there. In the time period of the judges, Gideon's son Abimelech had himself named king, by force, at Shechem, and ended up murdering around a thousand Shechemites for betraying him and then destroying the city. During the time period of the kings, Jeroboam I rebuilt Shechem as the capital city of northern Israel. And by the time of Christ, ancient Shechem had been in ruins since the Assyrian invasion of northern Israel. And the ruins of a Samaritan temple on Mount Gerizim were still visible from Jacob's well, where Jesus famously claimed to be the Messiah. Over the next few days here on Quick Study, you and I are going to be continuing to explore this ancient city of Shechem because there has been recent archaeological work done there and, and theories that have tried to explain the puzzle of Shechem in the Bible. And on tomorrow's program, you and I are going to be looking at, you know, what is that puzzle exactly? But basically what it has to do with is the, the, the book of Joshua itself, the area uh, that the Israelites are said to have conquered and, and the, the cities that they go after, they seem to skirt the area that what, that is known to be controlled by the ancient city of Shechem and her king. And it ties in the Amarna letters from Egypt uh, and, and information from Egypt that we know different wars and battles were going on in Canaan during the time period of Joshua. And it basically looks as if Israel had some sort of agreement uh, or treaty with this ancient 
ancient city of Shechem. And it's a puzzle because in the Bible, the Israelites weren't supposed to do this, but it, it appears as if there was some sort of treaty. So stick around tomorrow, come back and watch the program tomorrow because you and I are going to be delving into a really interesting theory put forward by Dr. Bryant Wood, uh, an, an archeologist and a Christian man as he wrestles with this puzzle of ancient Shechem. And we're also gonna be taking a look on the next day uh, of the ancient temple that was there and it shows up in the Bible even. You know, justice and righteousness are two key components to the word and the work of God in our life. The Bible is full of terms describing the rightness of God and living his way rather than falling into sin. Sin is a force emanating from Satan and infecting our soul. We can do nothing with righteousness or justice towards each other unless affected by the righteousness of God. Jesus Christ is the gift that God gave for our righteousness. When we invite Jesus as Lord of our life into our lives, he cleanses us, cleanses our soul from the effects of sin. This is critical for us to know and it's critical for us to understand. What many often forget is that Job was a man who knew God and he did his best to live and serve the Lord God. In fact, the first chapter records Job was a righteous man who knew his family might offend God. Although accused by his friends of violating God's commands, you know, Job had not. He refused to give himself over to a rebellious state. Job 27, verses 1 through 12. Moreover, Job continued his discourse and said, As God lives, who has taken away my justice, and the Almighty who has made my soul bitter, as long as my breath is in me and the breath of God in my nostrils, my lips will not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. Far be it from me that I should say you are right. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. May my enemy be like the wicked and he who rises up against me like the unrighteous. For what is the hope of the hypocrite, though he may gain much, if God takes away his life. Will God hear his cry when trouble comes upon him? Will he delight himself in the Almighty? Will he always call on God? I will teach you about the hand of God. What is with the Almighty I will not conceal. Surely all of you have seen it. Why then do you behave with complete nonsense? Job chapter 27, verses 1 through 12. We learn so much from the book of Job, not just from his friends, his three friends at the beginning and Elihu at the end, but we also learn from Job's response. And in Job's responses, we, we hear much about who God is and who Jesus Christ is. Yes, that's right, the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. We learn about that. And it's interesting to understand that Job was probably written during the times of the patriarchs. So it was likely before Abraham and all of that. So this is important because this is something at the beginning where God is dealing with this. Get your Bible guide out and turn to today's passage. It's very good. And if you don't have a Bible guide, why not? Write for your Bible guide today. And when you do write for it, use the address at the bottom of the screen. We'd be happy to send it to you. Send an offering in any amount, whatever God speaks to you. And when God speaks it, just do what he says. 
And you can also go to www.biblediscoverytv.com. And when you go there, click on donate and do a, a favor for me, if you wouldn't mind, pray about what God would have you give and make a donation in any amount. We would very much appreciate that. It helps us to continue. Now, this is interesting because I, I, I love the title of this. And this is really, there's really two things in the Old Testament that God speaks about and two things that God is focused on in the Word of God, the 66 books of the Bible. Justice and righteousness. Justice and righteousness or righteousness and justice, either one. Righteousness with God, being right with God, and justice with man. Very important. We're going to focus on that today. We're reading Job chapter 24 to 28 as we read this. I would encourage you, if you're going through the Bible with us, this is great. And then today we're going to look at and focus on Job 27, 1 through 12. And Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would help us to learn and to understand and then give us the courage to apply this to our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, this is important. Look at the scripture, Job chapter 27, 1 through 6. It says, moreover, Job continued his discourse and said, as God lives, he's talking about God now, he hasn't forgotten him, he's saying, I got to have him talk to me, as God lives, who has taken away my justice, God has taken away my just, so he thinks, and the Almighty who has made my soul bitter, so he thinks, as long as my breath is in me and the breath of God in my nostrils. He has the breath of God in his nostrils. That's interesting because that's what's said in Genesis chapter 3. Anyway, or Genesis chapter 2. My lips will not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. Far be it from me that I should say you are right. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast and I will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. This is fascinating. See, Job's response to his companions was simple. He refused to identify with what they said. We must never condemn anyone. See, this is important because there are people, and it looks like, and you're not sure whether it's the discipline of the Holy Spirit or whether it's an attack, a spiritual attack. Discipline of the Holy Spirit versus spiritual attack. Sometimes they look the same. You can't judge somebody for something that's happened if you don't know the picture. And most of us don't know the picture. And with Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and every other kind of thing, we can't presume to know the picture because we weren't there. And we're not the ones who are judging. God did not bring us into this world to judge others. Very important that we hear this in today's world of all of the social media and the internet interaction. Anyway, we go on to chapter 27, verse 7. It says, may my enemy be like the wicked and he who rises up against me like the unrighteous. For what is the hope of the hypocrite? Though he may gain much. If God takes away his life, will God hear his cry when trouble comes to him? Will he delight himself in the Almighty? Will he always call on God? What a great question that is. You see, Job identified himself with the righteous who have repented before God. That's who Job was. We must never assume anything about someone else. Very important because you cannot say, well, you know, you're going to hell and you're going to heaven and you can't say that. You don't make that decision. No person on this earth makes that decision. God Almighty makes that decision, beloved. We need to hear what Job is saying. He's crying out to God and he says, wait a minute, this is not right. Now we go back to these last two verses in Job 27. It says in verse 11, I will teach you about the hand of God what is with the Almighty, I will not conceal. Surely all of you have seen it. Why then do you behave with complete nonsense? That's amazing. 
You see, Job called the actions of those who condemned him nonsense, sense that makes no sense. We must be careful not to label people. I love this. I hate labels. People label me. They say, well, you're a baby boomer, or you're this, or you're that. I hate labels. I'm not a baby boomer. My name is Rod Hembry. I, I'm just a guy. I may have certain patterns or certain things, but I'm just a guy. Beloved, we need to understand this, that God did not make labels. He didn't. But God has us in such a way that Jesus Christ responds to the world, the whole world, all the parties, all the labor movements, all the social outfits. And he says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. That's Jesus Christ. He says that. So we need to understand that there's no culture or no movement or no anything because Jesus Christ made himself available for every single person at this moment. Come to Jesus today. Come to him and say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. Forgive me of all I've done and help me in Jesus' name. Amen. And when you say that, God will change everything and your life will be very different. Next time on Quick Study Television, we continue in Job and we come across, of course, Elihu again, and we're talking about it. So we're going to study that and look at it as we approach the end of Job. It's very good. So I want to encourage you to join us if you can. But right now, Ryan. Well, since the month of March, I've been sharing with you all the interviews I conducted at the 2017 Creation Super Conference, which took place in Ontario, Canada. And on yesterday's program, we finally reached the end of those interviews. But not to worry. If you'd like a hard copy of all the interviews uncut and uninterrupted, we've made it available to you on a three-disc set. In fact, there's a lot more material on the DVD set than you saw on the program. So I definitely encourage you to get a copy. Just simply contact us, and for a gift of $60 or more, we would, we'll send it directly to you. Well, with that being said, the interviews are now complete, and it's time to get back to our regularly scheduled Bible study. And I thought for the months of May and June, it would be a good idea to examine the lives of some of the men and women of the Bible to see what we can learn from them. Now, as you're all well aware, some of the biblical characters are godly, but others are definitely not. So I like to call this study Heroes and Heels of the Bible. And today we examine one of the greatest and oldest heroes of the faith, Job. It was approximately 2000 BC, and the man, Job, had the picture-perfect life. He lived in the land of Uz and was extremely wealthy, wise, and blessed with his wife and 10 children. He had great possessions, namely 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household. He was considered the greatest of all the people of the East and was extremely devout to God. Satan, however, was not impressed in the least. When God asks the fallen one to consider his servant Job, who is blameless and upright, and who fears God and shuns evil, Satan, or the accuser in Hebrew, accuses the man of God of having conditional love and loyalty to the Lord. Does Job fear God for nothing, he asks? 
Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Although Job is completely unaware of this otherworldly conversation, God takes Satan up on his challenge and allows him to plunder, kill, and destroy, though he is strictly forbidden from taking Job's life. Satan wastes no time. In a matter of moments, Job loses everything but his life and his wife. Messengers come in rapid succession to inform him of his losses. Sabaean raiders have stolen all of your oxen and donkeys and killed the workers. Fire from heaven has consumed your sheep and servants. Chaldeans have come and taken your camels and murdered your servants. Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead. Job's response is most startling. He tears his clothes, shaves his head, and falls to the ground to worship God. He proclaims, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Satan, however, is still not satisfied. Take away his health, he says to God, and Job will curse you to your face. When Job is struck with boils, his wife, enraged, says, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Job's friends were of no help either, since they believed that he had done something to deserve divine punishment. Though Job grew increasingly impatient with God, he still remained faithful despite Satan's best attempts to destroy that faith. In the end, God rebuked Job's friends and restored everything Job had lost. In fact, he gave him twice what he had before. So the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And after this, he lived 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. The many lessons we learn from Job's godly example are pretty obvious, so I won't get into that. But did you know that many old sayings that people still use actually come from the Bible? And in fact, three come from Job. One is, I escaped by the skin of my teeth. That comes from Job 19, verse 20. Another is from Job 1, 21, which says, Naked I came into this world, and naked I'll leave. A third saying from Job comes from the 21st verse of the first chapter, and says these famous words, The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Well, tomorrow we'll look at the lives of people we shouldn't be like, Job's three friends. All right, that's good, Ryan. I, I really enjoyed this today. The important part to remember is, Again, that statement at the end, uh, all of the things that we remember that we say and we don't think of, but they're from the Bible. Right. Yeah. And they're so, from Job. That's yeah. one of the oldest books of the Bible. Yeah. And uh, so there's a lot of sayings from the Bible, the writing on the walls from Daniel. Yeah. And you, you say, wait a minute. Yeah, that's true. Skin of my teeth from Job. <clears throat> wait a minute. <laughs> and so the Bible has really affected a lot of our vocabulary. Yes, it really has. And a lot of our words in today's world. That is very good. Thank you. I love Heroes and Heels, by the way. It's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All, All right. right. So we have from our May Bible Guide on page eight, we're going to talk about the concluding statement that you've made here in the Pocket Guide. And those of you that uh, study along with us and you do this weekly Bible study, it gives you an opportunity to hear how we discuss that. So the concluding statement is this, God knows we live in a sin-filled world. He came to save us from that. Still, there is a fight between sin and God. Now your last line says, we must win that fight with God's help. Hmm. So as we expand on that, what, what do we think that this means or how does this impact us or how do we win the fight? Well, I think, I think the fact that there is a fight and that it is winnable is demonstrated, you know, way back in Genesis with, with Cain and Abel, where God comes to Cain before, uh, before he kills Abel and says to him, Cain, sin is crouching at your door, but you must master it. So it's desirous for you, but you must master it. So, you know, that right there establishes the fact that there is a fight between, um, you know, evil and what, sin and our natural inclination to sin and to do what we want versus what we know is good for us and what, what God has decreed is actually good for us, mm -hmm. but that there it is winnable because otherwise, why would God? Did he master it? Mm -hmm. Cain did not, not mm -hmm. in that instance. What was the result? Banishment, death. 
-hmm. death exactly the yeah. wages of sin or death. That's Romans yeah. three or six twenty three. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Jesus came middle of time, mm -hmm. and he says very amazing. You just look at it and you say, did he just say that? In chapter sixteen of John, it says, you know, Jesus is talking thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen is the upper room and the discourse of mm -hmm. washing the feet and all that. And, and Jesus actually says there, he says, you know, I've come, not that you would have all these things, because they were thinking that the temple and, you know, he would yeah. take over. Yeah, earthly mm -hmm. kingdom. Mm -hmm. he, he's saying, not that you would have all these things yet, mm -hmm. but I've come so that you can win over sin, essentially. Mm. That you can master, that you can tell people about who I am so that they know. Now, why would that be? so effective. Mm -hmm. Telling people who Jesus is, why does that help them? Yeah. Well, well, just, you know, it's, it's a true, other than the fact that God does give you strength and he gives you power. And how does he do that? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know how he does that. I just know that it works. I know that I can ask him for help through Jesus and then, Christ. And he does, it works, you know, and it, it reminds me of, of, of how, how our bodies are built and manufactured. Like, you know, if I go try to lift a giant box by myself right now, I may not be able to, but the more I try and I slowly work up towards it, my muscles will grow. And it, it, God is that, that, that strength, that growing mm -hmm. of, you know, it is a muscle. You have to talk to him. You have to, you have to remember what's really important and you have to want to fight your battle against sin because we're going to fight it until the day that we die. Yeah, well, you, that's you, a good point. You said that really well. Our, we're used to growing our muscles by working, you know, do 10 reps, you know, and do all this mm -hmm. other stuff. And, and you do that and you do that and you do that. And finally you get strong. Mm -hmm. That's exactly how it works with Jesus Christ. That's exactly how it works with God. You go back to God and you say, Lord, I didn't make it, but yeah. help me, help me, help me. Mm -hmm. And you get through life, you get stronger and stronger. Well, it's and that stronger. it's that relationship with God of because course it it's is. not that your own self in that way has grown, but it's your relationship and the trust mm. that develops mm. uh, in with God. And scripture also says, re resist the devil yeah. and he will flee from you. And that I remember you preaching a sermon one time on the, that word resist. And you demonstrated that it didn't just mean like ho-hum resist or, or turn around, but you run away rapidly, you know, mm. and I remember you running down the, the <laughs> aisle of church and then around it. the doors and back in again, giving that demonstration that it, it's, it's not like the old comedian Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. And it was very flippant. It's really not funny. We need to resist the devil. He is the enemy. He is the thief. He comes to kill, steal and destroy. But with God's help, we are able to win that mm. battle with sin. Mm -hmm. It has been won through the Jesus. The only way you can do that with God's help, the only way you can have God's help is by asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart and saying, Lord, you be the Lord of my life. Then all of a sudden you've got God's help. And when you've got God's help, that doesn't mean you're perfect at that moment. But what it means is, is you've got the help of God to help you grow mm -hmm. and help you exercise and help you. That's the problem. Nobody wants to do the exercise. Everybody just wants to get big. Yeah. They don't want to do or the exercise. Or even just being honest with God. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah.